Richie Barnett, thank you for joining me on NRL Fans WA. Mike, good to be on your podcast, Jamie. Very cool. Looking forward to our chat. No, beautiful, mate. Thank you so much, mate. Like I said, I know you are a very busy man these days. I've seen um, on your social media stuff, you've uh, been doing a lot of uh, charity work and raising awareness for a lot of different things. So, um, yeah, I know that you're, you're very busy and I know you do some uh, work with Sky Sports over there in New Zealand. So thank you for joining me. No problem. Um, we'll jump into your career, mate. Um, you played over 150 first, uh, first grade games. Um, play for Sharks, Roosters. Um, then you go over to England, play for London and Hull FC. Um, you've also represented New Zealand on a few times as well. Um, when you look back on your career, buddy, is there anything that you've taken from your professional sporting career that's made you into the man, the husband, father that you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, there's many things, actually. From a sporting perspective, I think at an early age, being involved in sport had many benefits. It uh, created life skills that I, was, I, I used in work, business, charities, and in my behaviour, actually. Um, so with sport, obviously, you have to learn to work with an, um, a team. You have to understand your role. Um, you have to um, deal with ad, um, disappointment um, and being resilient. Um, you have to work your little butt off to get to where you want to be. Um, challenges are there for a reason. Um, it's how you deal with them and how much you desire to get to, to, to reach your goal. You learn off others. You learn off uh, coaches. Um, along your long career, when you're a youngster, right up to your professional career, there's everybody who makes an impact to your life. They are there for a reason too, to support you along the way. And, and they are so beneficial and so important to how you, um, who you become along the way. Um, I learned from my injuries along the way, how to deal with that. I learned how to deal with um, pressure. I had to learn to get back on the paddock when um, I was on uh, long-term injuries to deal with that, uh, to ensure that my performance is at a high standard. Um, I learned to have a lot of fun. Uh, I learned to balance that out. I learned to move, shift my, myself away from the sport so I can have that downtime. So I'm not thinking about the sport all the time. I was lucky I had a very, very good partner um, who, I, who I've been um, together since I was 15. So that rock and that solid foundation to go back to and, and enable me to be the person I am, I wouldn't have done it without her. Um, my friends, my friendships, my long-term friendships are very, very important to me. My family and my friends are really important because they're, they're people like that balance you out, um, which is great. Um, yeah, so there's, there's tons to, to take on board what sport has given me. There's no question about that. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, like the perfect answer. Like I've asked that to a few other people and the way you've described that then is so detailed. Um, a lot of people haven't given such a de detailed description, but <laughs> um, it's great to, to hear that detailed description because I know a lot of people these days, uh, young people, they do get a bit disheartened when they do have those setbacks. Um, and, you know, I just had my niece recently competing for WA over in Queensland for the under 18s comp. She got a, um, she got a concussion <clears throat> and was ruled out for the rest of the tournament. And um, she was a bit down and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, I asked a few people to message her and um, they, they, they did that, which was great, but it's just, yeah, and they all said the same sort of thing. You know, those injuries and setbacks are what make you um, better in the long run. So, you know, for you to and say that as well. One. And it's a really hard one uh, because we sort of, you understand it, but and through the eyes of which that person is going through and how they frame things is very important, you know. Yeah. So no matter what you say, it's how they receive the information, how they deal with it. So they create the meaning of what that, that is. The event that happened, the injury, they create the meaning. Nothing has a meaning to the meaning you give it, right? And then you focus on all the things that you're losing or lost. 
And so you get, in, get into quite a little deep little hole to some degree unless you find um, a better meaning and better focus and what's at the end of that, you know, through, and I know it's hard for people to, to see it whilst they're going through um, a time span, which could be a lengthy period out. But the, the ultimate goal is to see what could be achieved by going through pain and suffering and resilience. Um, and what you can do going through that is just takes you to another level. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. And I think sometimes it does help. Um, like I mentioned with my niece, you know, someone else pointing that out. Um, yeah. you, sometimes you do need that little yeah, you do. advice and that little kick to sort of go, hey, it's not the end. You know, there yeah. is more more coming. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's cool, man. Um, with... You know, speaking with your early career, you mentioned about your partner. Um, you've been together since you were 15. Um, was there anyone else in your life um, that influenced you and you sort of, I guess, idolised um, growing up? There is a ton, mate. There is a ton. I think we've got to give respect to the, my, my mother and my father who gave me the opportunity to get into sport and the love and caring nature of my mother. So I had a very, very good upbringing. Um, and my brothers, uh, my brothers who I grew up with were very competitive. So, you know, being the youngest of four or five, there was always an element where I just wanted to compete. And because I was the youngest, um, it was just a, a competition every time, you know, no matter what it is, it's, you, you, can, you can imagine it, right? So everything was a competition would be, I'd play with them and they're a year older and my other brother's a year older, but I played in the same team. My dad was the coach and we were playing rugby at that time. So, you know, I give respect to my father and my parents for, for giving me the guidance at an early age. Um, and my friends who were so well balanced and we had so much fun, but we always were playing sport together. So my mates were such an influence in my life because of who they were. And secondly, our relationship was so bloody harmonious and so much fun that we had during that time. Um, that was brilliant for me. Um, but the idols that I had, because I had an early goal at a very early age, around 14, that I was going to play Winfield Cup. Um, and people would laugh at me because it was just too far away from even considering that, right? But I had a very early goal. So what I constructed was what they call vision boards now, uh, where you have to see it, feel it, and understand it. So I used to have all these pictures of all the NRL teams, we used to buy the rugby league week every week and I'd rip those out and I'd stick it up on my wall and I'd have all the teams, all on my wall. So all I saw when I woke up was the rugby league teams. I, you know, I was a big fan of Mark Graham. I was a big fan of the Sorensons. I was a big fan of Mal Meninga. I was a big fan of all the old players back in the day in Australia that and I used to watch, we, see, we, used to, we didn't used to get the live games here, so we used to get it in uh, vid videos. So we used to have to watch a whole full week. So I used to then go and watch them. And then I used to, I, I still got a book to this day of how the Aussies trained. Yeah, okay. And I've still got it to this day where I bought, my mum bought it for me, and then I started training the way they did. So I adopted all the methods they did. Wow. And I implemented it. So I actioned everything, seen it, hear it, do it, and that's what I did. Yeah. That's how I got to where I was. It wasn't by chance. It was just because I was very vigilant and I knew exactly where I wanted to be and how that was going to be placed, following the best in the game. As we know, the Australians were the best at that professionalism at that time. So I followed them. Yep. Yeah. Wow. That's that's so cool to hear. That's um, like, you know, like I said before, I've talked to a fair few players about that sort of stuff and like that detail, it's just like for me, hearing that um, and for the people that watch this, because I've got young kids at home. I've, I mean, I've got 10 kids that live at home and wow. a lot of them, they watch my um, interviews and stuff. My, my partner watches them with me as well. And to hear that description of another way that kids can look at how they can get into whatever profession or whatever their choice is in life. Um, that's so cool to hear. So yeah. I really thank you for that. That's yeah. another thing that, you know, these kids of today can go, well, hang on, if Richie Barnett's doing this, especially the young, I guess the young Māori kids, young yeah. New Zealand kids, yeah, 
see that and they go, wow, wow, Richard Barnett, that's how he did it. Oh, maybe I could use that as well. So, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Cheers, man. No, that, oh, mate, it's, it's, it's really refreshing to hear that. That's, um, yeah, cool. Really, really cool. Um, you make your debut for the Sharks, mate, in 1994. Um, I know you were playing league over in, in New Zealand uh, previous to that. Um, how did you get to be able to come over to Australia and make your debut for the Sharks? It, it was interesting, eh? Because I was sitting in my at our house and I was on the couch and my mum got a call and she goes, oh, this is man on the phone and wants to talk to you. And I said, oh, okay, we're well, cool. Uh, and one of these guys that I'm just about to mention was on my... Um, on my vision board or on my on my wall, Arthur Beetson was on the phone, and um, and I went, "It's Arthur, it's Arthur Beetson." Oh my God, it's Arthur Beetson! And he asked me, he "Goes right, do you want to come over?" Obviously, he was a talent scout, right? And he was the coach of the Cronulla Sharks in '93, and he he basically said, "I want you over here." And before I got over there, he had left, so and John Lang took over the role, but uh, that person got me over there. So he identified wow. me somehow, and I'm not sure how. Um, I got there because of him. And it's funny enough, not long after, through the Roosters, when I went to the Roosters, he was the he was there at the time. So, you know, he was the, the great man that uh, changed the game. Yeah, right. That's, that would have been pretty cool. You know? oh, yeah. He would have been one of those guys that you would have looked up oh, to yeah. as well. Jeepers, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, you ended up playing 67 games for the Sharks. Um, like you just mentioned, then you jump over to the Roosters um, in 98. Um, and then you end up going over to London. So you play 51 games for the Roosters, and then you go over to play for London, um, for the London Broncos in the Super League. How did, um, how did that come about? I had, a, I had an option on my fourth year with the Roosters and I went through that uh, facial reconstruction yep. uh, and the test match and it was pretty traumatic through that period of time and I think I just wanted to get out of Sydney. Uh, you know, I, it just, you know, I was, didn't really want to leave the Roosters, to be fair. Um, but something said to me I had to go for my own... I had no separation from the sport because it was a traumatic experience for me. So I, I left to go to London. They were recruiting a lot of Aussies and Kiwis at the time to bolster the, the uh, London Broncos. They were um, owned by Rich, Sir Richard Branson. Um, so we had Jimmy Dimmitt, Jason Hetherington, Nigel Roy, Tony Martin, <coughs> and a few of the, there was still uh, Tony Mestro. They were all still there, but we came in about four or five of us and we tried to bolster that side. So that's how that came about. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Had a lot of fun. Yeah. How, um, did you enjoy the experience being over in England? I know you later went on to Hull FC. Yeah. Um, but did you enjoy the, the difference? I know, obviously, the, um, the cult, different culture over there um, oh. towards rugby league as well. And then you know, it all, was all the, the different style of play that they yeah, played over in England as well. It was it was tough for us because there were the sides that were really big. You know, we were small. We we struggled to be honest. We had Bradford, St Helens, Leeds. They were huge men. Wigan. They were massive. We just couldn't contain them in our forward pack. We were just they they were big humans. Um, but I enjoyed it. Nothing changes for us. And people think that they go over there and you have a little rest and you you get your you know your salary. But I'm like, hell no. I don't think a Jimmy Dimmock would ever think that. I don't think a Jason Hetherington would ever think that way, and certainly not me. We go over there to play and give everything that we've got. That's the way we've been wired. Um, and I loved it because of what I came through again, you know, through uh, the facial reconstruction. I Nothing really. It took. It, it actually, that took me to a whole different level. I was the fittest I've ever been at 29. I was faster. I was breaking... I think I broke a record and I had a hamstring tear and it kept tearing. So I played, I don't know, half a season and then I ran probably the most of any full, uh, any back or whoever. Uh, in any season, I ran the most metres ever. Wow. Um, so I, I was killing it over that period of time. 
Um, and the older I got, the faster I became, but the more smarter I became in that, in that regard. Yep. So I, I, I absolutely loved where I was at. I was breaking records. I was having the best fun. And I just saw the game in quite a different light. You know, when they, 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 they do say that, you know, you see it before it actually happens. And that's exactly how I saw it. I was visually, I saw the game opening up. I had plenty of space and time. I was a lot faster and fitter than I, than I was early on, believe it or not. Um, it was just the way I, the way I trained and, and the way I um, became who I am. But yeah, I loved it. And I went to Hull. Unfortunately, I got chronic fatigue through that period halfway through the London and um, Hull FC and that again, far out. Yeah, I couldn't ask for a harder period, mate. Going through yeah. chronic fatigue, it was, um, it was something that I'd never, ever want anyone else to go through. It was tough. Yeah, I bet. Absolutely, yeah. I bet. Um, I know, like I mentioned before at the start, you played um, a few games for New Zealand. You end up captaining them as well. Yeah. Um, being a, 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 a Māori man, how was that um, playing for New Zealand, getting to represent your country, um, doing the haka, um, yeah. you know, and doing all that sort of stuff? Yeah. It was um, a, how was that for you, mate? Yeah, cool. It was everything I thought it would be. It was a, a very much an honour to put on that jersey for the players that come before me and, and after and uh, to be able to do it. Um, in such a short space of time. Um, and I think I was just really honoured, but I felt that I did all the work prior to that to get to where yeah. I was. And I knew I had a long way to go as well to to um, to beat, you know, the Australians who were the best, but just to be in presence of other people, particularly, you know, through that era with Gary Freeman coming through, we, you know, um, that sort of age group guys coming through and we just got the tail end of it. So we're able to, to grab their knowledge and, and and then grow as individuals. But it was an honour to captain the Kiwis. It was a real honour to lead. It was a real honour to um, be a really proud, I think, Māori person um, to stand up there and, and be at the forefront of the Kiwis. It was something very special. Uh, and I heard that from... Um, uh, who was it that told me that? Uh, Matthew Ridge, he said, you, you, you'll realise when you're captain how 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 honourable that is. And I said, yeah, I, I, I cannot wait. And, and it happened, and, it, and he was damn right. Yeah. Was damn right. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty awesome to hear. Yeah. Um, speaking of um, being mouldy men, where, where does your... Um, Whānau originate from? Where, where, yeah. What's your... So we're the far north. So my, we're, we're far north. We're Ngāpui, um, which is the, right up the top of the North Island. Um, and my dad's side is from the, the south or the mid-central to South Island, actually. So I've got a Māori mum and a Pākehā dad. Uh, so a nice little combination there. And um, Yeah, so I am, I've got the best of both worlds there and you know, we 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 got, I, I grew up in Auckland, so um, we quite a different sort of lifestyle from the far north. Yeah. Um, and I respect that. I, I love going up the far north. It's my connection. It's where my yeah. roots lie, and it feels so good going back. It feels so good. Yeah. It's, it's a spiritual yeah. connection, eh? Yeah, I bet. Um, my missus from uh, got Fano. That's from up uh, to Colway. Oh, to Colway. Oh, yeah. right up. Yeah, right at the top. So yeah, she's um, Kuri. She must be Nati Kuri then. I'm so not she's sure. Which she, is she? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's uh, it'll be Nati Kuri possibly, but um, yeah, we we actually came through there not long ago. It's a nice. It's a little, a little place. <laughs> yeah. She's a little place. Yeah. Um, but she's got also Fano from um from Rotorua as well. Oh um, yeah. So she got a bit of a tarawa in her as well. And oh, yeah. Tarawa, yeah, yeah, yeah. As well. uh, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, well, I've been an Aussie myself, uh, moving over to New Zealand and being with her, I got to learn a lot about the culture. And, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I lived over there for four years, so uh, got to see a lot of different things and a lot, lot of different stuff. I'm so sure. Cool. But, yeah, um, with um, you growing up in Auckland, um, and seeing the growth of rugby league and um, 
in the game to the game today. Um, I mean, I've had a chat with Nigel Bungana, um, and he he was saying when he was working for uh, New Zealand Rugby League um, that the growth of the game needs to happen a bit more around the country before a team can be a second team can be put in New Zealand. Um, yeah. Yeah, what are your, your thoughts on that? Bear with me for a second. I think my 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 battery might be. Um, uh, that's okay. Um, my thoughts on that. Um, the game itself, particularly around the physicality of the game, is dwindling down. It's dwindling down. The numbers are, are suggesting that both rugby and rugby league. Yep. The options for kids now is quite um, diverse. So, and the kids are getting bigger. So kids have got kids have got more options, and I and they see probably rugby rugby league is um, an option. Sorry, there we go. Yep. They have um, so they're opting to do things like basketball. I think volleyball is starting to spike up now. Rugby rugby league thirty percent down. What else? Um, so there's many options now. Yeah. Um, the attractiveness to what we've seen in the NRL is drawing. NRL is such a powerful medium for young players in New Zealand, plus rugby, love watching the NRL. It's, yeah. such, it's such a good vehicle. It's the attraction to the sport is growing substantially and everyone loves watching it. The rugby union here in this country is starting to dwindle down yeah. because of the rules and the downtime in the game. So there's been a bit of a crossover to rugby league now. It's becoming such a, a, an interesting sport, but the numbers are not telling us in New Zealand. The numbers yeah. or participation's not. Yeah, right. I was um, listening to Tony uh, Tony Kemp about that. He was yep. saying that you know the um, the support for rugby union. Not the support, but the the viewing um, is is going down. But yeah, it's going down huge. Um, you know, and it's like you said, it's the downtime. You know, all the injuries. Are, it's 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 not. A, I guess it's a, one of those things where the sports do ebb and flow up and down. Whether they, um, but I think it's also coming down to how long the season is. The international games in between. It is. Yeah, you know, and it's like they're almost making a full year out of rugby Correct. union and Correct. people are just getting over it and getting bored. That's right. I yeah. absolutely agree with that because they, there's never a downtime. So what rugby league do very well in this country is they have a three month gap where people rest up and they get very eager once the, the season starts. So they're drawing upon that emotion to go, well, well I can't wait for the season to, to, to start up where rugby just yeah. draws out. They've got so many competitions and it's it, the in, and, it, and it's just saturating the market and people are just getting bored of it, um, getting bored of it because now I think if we look at both sports now, rugby league are now having 5% more time in play now based yeah. on the stats just currently and rugby is probably losing about 5%, probably more now in play because of the rules, the, yeah. the endless rules and the is just hard to comprehend how they can actually run this game. If, and they're not innovative enough to change it right now. Where rugby league will change things, rules, just like that. Yeah. Rugby are not doing it. They're not adjusting to it. And you know with kids now, where their attention spans very, you know, we all have that now, right? So yeah. we get bored really easy because of the, the social media and our brain stuff, it's just turns over so quick that they're just getting bored. Yeah. So rugby league now becomes, oh, that's attractive. Rugby is boring. I'm bored. I'll just get on my phone and start, you know? Yeah. It's happening, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not, like that's that's one of the things for me. Like, I've talked to a lot of people um, that I work with. Um, I've got a few Fijians and stuff like that that, uh, that I work with. Yeah, they, they follow the league, but obviously being from Fiji, their, their main game is union. Um, and yep. obviously because they're really good with the sevens um, yep. tournaments. Um, and we talk to talk about league and stuff like that. And I, I say to them, I can't watch Union. It um, it it bores me. I get bored, you know. And it's not because um, the game is is um, 
there's heaps of games during the year. It's just because the game is too slow for me. It is. You know, it's so many rock breakdowns and it's yep. like, you know, I'll, I just go, oh, get on with yep. it. Like, you know, whereas league gets, you know, your five tackle sets or six tackle sets, kick the ball, return it, and it's just constantly going. You yeah. know, when the ball goes out these days off, off the end of a set, it's straight back in, play the ball, let's go. And it's so it's so good to see, you know, it's a constant moving thing. And um, like you said, I think that's that's what the attraction is, is it's a constant moving game, yeah. um, you know, and like you said, the administrators are, are able to adapt new rules and make it a lot quicker game. Re you know, they're starting to look after the players with the HIAs and everything else. You know, I do I do understand the fans get a bit um, annoyed and, and ho ho with that, but they got to understand that you know these guys are looking after the players in the future. We've we've seen so That's many. Right. I mean, you you would understand this more than anyone. With them um, being retired and stuff like that, but the people that are retired coming out with more um, illnesses and and stuff from getting their heads hit all the time when they were younger. Like, That's like right. And a perfect example of that would be uh, Paul Green. Yep. So you know, having played with Paul and coming through exactly the same time as Paul and staying in their house with him, um, yep. that to me just shocked shocked me um but knowing what he was like and, and what the person he was the articulate uh person he was so smart and intelligent uh everything seemed to be perfect in his life yep. and unfortunately through the through the this is it the cte issue um they opened it up and found out that he had that you know so yeah, you've, and, and, but we, we can't not only look at what the rugby league do now, it's what we do when they're younger because that's, yeah. that's, that's where we have to start having yeah. downtime when someone's... And it's not that you have to be concussed to be knocked out, you know, to, and be knocked, yeah. knocked out to actually feel that your brain has been wobbled with your little pee. It's yeah. all that impact, the, the G-force that's happening. If you get hit on, on a knee, that's trauma to the head. So we've got to be really mindful. And yes, it starts when we're early and we're managing it for a long term of, of our players and for our young ones coming through. It's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of that, especially with the young kids too, um, I, I don't do this as a parent um, because I understand I am writing to the game with the, you know, the concussions and all that sort of stuff, but it comes down to the parents and if their kids get injured, you know, get a head knock and they might be slightly concussed or they're watching the game and they see their head, their child get hit, they need to, I guess, be that parent and go, hang on, look, I don't think you should be playing next week. You know, give them a week off, whatever it is. You know, the NRL has introduced that 11-day stand down. Yeah. But I um, I recently did that with one of my kids. Um, he had um, a big hit in his head. Wasn't feeling the best after the game. Um, and I said, cool, that's fine. You know, you can't go to training, can't go to the games um, for a week. You know, we let his coach know and the coach was like, yep, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. You know, I think it comes back to the parents as well. The coaches, yeah, it does. And I think, I think the governing body has to make a stand. So if there's anything that happens to a child and gets knocked, there's an automatic stand down for a period of time. So they do that in this country here with rugby union. I think league's got it as well. Where there's an automatic three week stand down. Yep. So that's what needs to happen. It's got to be a policy driven, driven up, and that's what it is, you know. And yep. um, make it mandatory. Yep. Um, but you're right. It comes down to your parents, and now you know. And, and something I've got to say: some parents are, are not are not well informed to be able to make decisions. Some of them. Oh yeah. Say. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the ones who have yeah, lost the plot, but generally now it's quite open and it's okay for our kids to have that time because it's so important. Eh? The, the days yeah. are gone where we're, you know, like, the game, son, you know, <laughs> carry on. The day yeah. things knocked out, you know, and we're, we're like the cold knocked out and then get back and we, we're on the bloody paddock again. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And at times we did that. Oh, right. I remember getting knocked in uh, a Cronulla game. And I got knocked that bad. I stood up and played the ball the other way. And even <laughs> yeah. laughed. I even laughed. I couldn't even hear what they were doing. I didn't know what I was doing. And I carried on. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that yeah. was only one occasion of many. Yeah. 
And it's, I mean, that's just, the, for me, it's just a testament to the game and the administrators of how far they've come and how how they've taken all this other stuff um, to, to heart and understanding what needs to be done. Yeah, you and know? they should because there's a liability clause in there too. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, no, so yes, um, there's two sides to that. And, you know, that they, they have got players that are now going for the NRL. Yeah. Uh, because of that, um, and, and they're doing it here also with rugby union players now. Yeah. Um, so, but um, yeah, that's just the way it is. I'm glad that it's evolved and we're getting cleverer and smarter and giving our our safety to our sport to ensure that our players' welfare and um, is looked after. So it's very vitally important, and it helps our kids to make the right choice when they're young, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Safe, safer place. Absolutely, mate. Um, so just want to get your advice um, or your opinion, sorry, on the 18th team coming up. Um, you probably would have seen in the news, Perth obviously wanted to put in a bid. Um, North Sydney, they've, they've talked to North Sydney and apparently even Newtown Jets have uh, tried to come in with Perth as well. Um, what are your thoughts and chances? I mean, you would have played probably in the era where the Western Reds were in. Yep. Um, what are your thoughts on the chances of Perth, whether it be with a Sydney-based club or by themselves, what do you think our chances would be? Jeepers, I'm, I'm thinking, can Sydney sustain another team? Is more yeah. the question, you know? I look at New Zealand and I don't know if, we we can support another team at the moment. I'm not. I'm. I really don't think we're ready for that. Yeah. Um. I know. I don't know about Sydney. It's. It's so. I don't know. It's saturating a market, and they're struggling. Yeah. You know, some of them are struggling already, right? When you look at Cronulla and George in p- close proximity, you're mm. actually drawing. Um. You're drawing. You're pulling away. Um. The crowds. I, I believe I, I just don't know about the Sydney thing, and I don't yeah. know. I've done the numbers around. I'm sure they're I'm sure they're analysing that and understanding what that would look like, um, and who puts the bid and how financially successful they are, because yeah. that's the other thing they should they'll be looking at. Who's the backers? Can they sustain it for a period of time? Western Reds. Uh, well, the, I remember the Western Reds going there every uh, once in a while. It was a really hard place to play when you have a six hour um, trip yeah. and then the time frame so different and your chaotic rhythms quite out so it was really hard to play there yeah. uh, but I, I, I always feel that those teams and those regions have always been a talking point the growth in the western Australia um, and they always said it's they're not ready for it but now that the Australian NRL is so powerful and things are going so nicely that maybe it becomes a, a more of an attractive proposition for them to look at, yeah. seriously look at. But I don't know who's put it. Uh, is there a bid going in there from a consortium? Yeah, so uh, Venues West um, and the state government have put in, yeah, um, have put in that they want to put in a bid. Oh. Um, and the state government and uh, Venues West, yeah, have talked to um, North Sydney Bears because North Sydney Bears know, I, th- I think um, the, pre- uh, the president and CEO of, of North Sydney Bears understand that, you know, Sydney is saturated, that they yeah. they probably won't get in by themselves. Yeah. And all they're asking for is, you know, a couple of games to be played at North Sydney over a year. Uh-huh. And... Cool. And for um, the traditional rivals to play mainly at North Sydney Oval. Oh yeah. So you know, and I, I think it would be a really great pathway for the WA kids. Um, you know, and it gives North Sydney um, more more ki- more people to pick from. You know. Yeah. yeah. And they've got a, they've got a Harvey Norman's women's competition team, so the women have a pathway too. Then. You know, and I think it would be a really good idea, but in the other sense too, that it also gives the Perth team a supporter base on the East Coast. Yeah. You know, yeah. so 
they're not just going for North Sydney or they're not just going for Perth. They're going for the joint venture. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, whether they're playing down in Melbourne or at Allianz Stadium or up in Brisbane, they've got, you know, Bear supporters there. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a fantastic option because they're, they're, they're a, a, <coughs> a new venture. So having a two teams to support in different regions makes it easier, no, yeah. as opposed to joining old old yep. um, foundational clubs together yep. and it just it's very hard to, to make that work yeah. as we've seen in the past. But it's such a good option. I quite like that option, yeah. Yeah. Quite like option. Um, yeah, and like I said, I think it's the pathways. I think that's... Because we, we are losing a lot of kids over here probably around that 14, 15-year-old age to rugby union because there's no not enough pathways over here at the moment. Yeah, interesting. Eh? We, we used to have... Um, the West Coast Pirates in the SG ball. Yep. So the under 18s. Um, and once COVID hit, it's gone. Um, and which is understandable at the time, but they haven't brought it back. And I think uh, a lot of the kids are starting to see that there's no pathway at the moment. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, they've had to there's a few West Australian um, players that have moved up, had to move over east um to get into the NRL, so or the NRLW. So you know, which is a pretty crappy option, in my opinion, but at least yeah, they're, it is a, they're doing it. Is. It. It, is, it, is, it is a it is a transitional, it, can, it could be a transitional nightmare for kids moving from out of West, Western Australia to Sydney. Yeah. You know, and as we know, that transition is, is it could be the, it could be great or it could, uh, could, could turn, spiral these kids down yeah. because they need their family. They're, they're in their own environment and we know with the transition and most of these kids that move over from here to there, they get home to Yeah. And that causes, every, that causes the success button for sure. Yeah. Well, I, I even had an interview with um, Nathan Highmarsh and he said he struggled with it moving from the bush to Parramatta. Yeah, so did you I. Know? Yeah, and it's like, it, it's if they don't have the right support system in, you know, these kids are just going to go, no, nah, I don't want to play. I don't care. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. see you later. You know, I was, I was 21 and I was homesick. Never, yeah. I've actually never, never been on a flight overseas and I separated from my family, my connection, my, my friendships. And I did not like it. I was very homesick, but it didn't stop my performance. Yeah. It didn't, for me, it didn't stop my performance because I still put in and I still was getting the results, but I felt very empty. Yeah. Very yeah, empty. Bet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, okay, we'll jump off that Perth subject then. Yeah. <laughs> what, I, I've got a lot of kids, um, you know, that I've coached and all that sort of stuff that watch my um, YouTube channel and they watch, um, you know, all these interviews that I do. And I ask every person, what's some advice that you've got for young kids coming up um, in regards to um, whatever they want to uh, pursue in life? Doesn't matter if it's rugby league or being a doctor or whatever, but what's some advice that you've got for them? Yeah, so young, <coughs> young people are unsure of what they want at an early age. And sometimes they're influenced by their parents um, you should do this or they match and mirror what their parents would like to do and they just naturally go that way. Um, I would ask the kids, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What is your passion? What are you good at? What would that look like if you decided what that would be? What yeah. would that look like to you? And then once you look at that and decide your strengths in that, then you can nail it down a little bit more and you can really start to hone in on something that you feel that could be um, right for you. If you then get something that you would like, then go and speak to someone who's done it before and talk to them about it. Um, you know, success leaves clues. So you always go to the, per not the person that tells you about it who hasn't actually done it, but go to the person that actually does and everyone knows somebody in that industry or in that sporting realm. Go and have a conversation with them, pick their brains and, and then make an informed decision based on actuals as opposed to what you think things will look like. Because we get too many kids now who go to university without really knowing what they want to do, but that's just the natural way to go. It's just 
default, you have to go there. But when you actually know what you want, that's the power. That's that is the that's the power there. Knowing what you want, like a GPS, knowing where you want to go, and you know directly those lines where you need to get. Um, but in life, people are just going, just leaving it to life to make those decisions for them, as opposed to what they should be doing. And if, if I think kids can get a decision at an earlier age and go right, that's what I want. Well, then that is to me absolute gold. No, yeah. absolutely perfect, perfect advice there, mate. Um, another question that I always ask everyone, mate. You know, we spoke about Paul Green before. Um, you know, mental mental illness. Have you gone through something that's, um, I guess, class as mental illness, you know, or a depression or whatever it is? And if so, how did you get through it? Yeah, I think <laughs> mental illness is. And I don't like to use the word association to mental illness, so I always think it's a well-being thing or the ebbs and flows, the seasons of emotions that we experience. Yep. Some will experience longer than others. If it stays there, what we call the emotional home that people live in, and these many factors and reasons behind what people would go through to understand what their behaviours are. So for me, I went through... I lost my brother at an early age when he passed away at a car crash when I was 16. I, um, which was pretty damn impactful. And then I had my facial reconstruction. It was very traumatic. Um, I got 10 places inserted in my face. I was in intensive care for seven days. I had a tracheotomy. So things were over. So having to go through that, not having any support, was really difficult because I didn't know what was going to happen because I thought my career was over. Chronic fatigue absolutely hammered me left, right and centre. So I physically couldn't even, I was fatigued all the time. So naturally I spiralled into a bit of a depressed, depre depressed state. Yeah. And so I had to try and manage that. I didn't know how, but I just did. And I got through it, but it was long periods of time. So... I've always been a very optimistic person where I would always see the good the good in every situation. If I would turn back the time, I would absolutely have gone to get some psychological help to get me through it because I thought I had to do it all myself. We just didn't know about those things. But knowing what I do know now, I would absolutely have gone there to get me through those things to work on my top two inches because everything else was exactly right. I could do that, I could smash it out, trainings, and I'd be fit as anything. But when I came back from that facial injury, when I got back to my first league game after eight months, the thoughts in my head start to spiral around, what happens if this happens again? Can I do it? And there was so much information going on in my head. So I needed some support in that. I couldn't sleep for two weeks before the prior to the first game. I was thinking of everything that could go wrong as opposed to what could go right. I got through and I scored two tries and I got the player of the day. But the fact was that I went through it and I had to go through all that emotional energy prior to a game. And I didn't need to do that. But it made me very resilient, back me wrong, but I didn't have to go through that. I needed some tools in the toolkit to get me through those times. And yep. we, like I'm in the suicide prevention game right now with, with kids. We've got a charity that we run. And that's what we do. This is what we do in our business now. So we've got stats galore. We understand what kids are going through to, um, to work with them and break the stereotype around mental health and well-being because people will not open up about mental health and well-being because yep. of the stigma associated with it. So the, our, our goal is to break that stigma first and foremost and talk about bullying and all that sort of stuff in schools. So we've got in-school programs and then we've got a then we've got to solve the problem of getting help, immediate help to those kids for us. And we can't get that through the public system because there's too, too long away times. And the system is the, the systematic issue that we've got in all DHBs is that it's just bad. It's poor. It's dreadful. So that's what we do. But yeah, it's, it's a good question. And, and um, But I would really lean on people to support you and, and go see a counsellor, go see a psychologist and deal with the little problems before they get to the big problems because it's very hard when you get to a crisis point to deal with it then. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mate, that's perfect. I absolutely agree with you, mate. Yeah, those little problems, 
you know, you, you don't probably you don't think about them as little problems at the time. You just uh, you sort of brush it off. But yep. yeah, it's if someone you just it, I guess you don't need to really go see a counselor or a psychologist. I think you know if you if you want to go see them, that's great. But if you've got someone that you can bounce off and give you proper sound advice, I think that's the start. You know. Yep. There is and two of those. Is one is, is our kids open enough to have that conversation with someone because that's not yeah. what's happening right now. They yeah. they don't feel so. The three things that we learn with kids, they fear what people might think, say, or do. Yeah, forty percent of the kids in in New Zealand will leave school with a suicidal thought. The reason why they will not approach our 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 parents, the ones that love them the most, is because they just don't want to dis disappoint them. Yeah. So what we've got to do as parents is show some vulnerability to our kids because if they're trying to show us vulnerability, how on earth are we supposed to allow them to be vulnerable to us when we're not vulnerable to them? It's a give-give situation. So I'm not saying being vulnerable and cry all the time. I'm saying being vulnerable about some situations that you've been through to say to them, I'm glad that you're here to hear it. Yeah. And you're, you know, they become the solution, not the problem to it. And then when you open that door to those kids, then they realize, oh, that's normal. That's yeah. normalizing what pe people are going through. Because all they see is perfection in the world now. My dad just does this. My mum never gets anything wrong. They never have any issues. It's just, they're just perfect. Yeah. Social media, showing things on social media, filtered. Look at, we have our best life, all our lovely photos that we do on travel. And everything's painted as being perfect. So they live in a perfect world. Yep. And we don't show things on social media about us looking pretty <coughs> shitty, right? That yep. just doesn't happen. So yep. we need to be the leaders in that by showing shitty photos once in a while on social media. Don't take the best photos, take the shitty photos. Yep. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I or else we, become, <clears throat> we become the problem as well because I said all the time, no, I think I take that. Oh, no, 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 my face is like that. Take the first shot and that'll do. That's it. Yep. And you know, you've seen it, eh? Well, this is the way we live now. Trying to yep. get that perfect photo just so you can send it out and people go, wow, you look yep. amazing. <clears throat> That's not life. Yep. Exactly, <laughs> not yeah. Life. That, is, that is a superficial life, life in a nutshell. Yep. I mean, I try to tell my kids all the time, you know, you think life's hard, life is hard now. It gets harder and harder and harder and harder as you get older, the more things that come your way. It's how you deal with things now. And, you know, we try to talk to our kids about, you know, how we're going to do deal with this situation or deal with that and all that sort of stuff. So I said, life doesn't get any easier for you. It doesn't matter. You can try and make it as easy as you want, but life doesn't make, uh, it doesn't make anything easier. You know, there's, there's certain things that are going to get thrown at you you know, for an example, you know, you, you think you have a good life and then suddenly a family member or a close friend passes away or gets injured and it, it doesn't matter. Life, life sucks. Yeah. You, know, you try to make the best out of, out of your life and absolutely enjoy what you can, but life doesn't get any easier as you get older. It gets a bit harder because more responsibility comes on you and all that sort of stuff. Mm. But, yeah, we try to teach our kids that, you know, to deal with those, those, um, I guess, external pressures and stuff for that. And, you know, not let it get to them and talk about it. You know, that's what we try to do with our kids anyway. Yeah. That's awesome. Because, you know, I guess these days with kids now there, um, the barometer is really from the external influence that that is causing them to not understand the internal economy. Yeah. So, you know, we talk a lot about that with kids around who are you, what are your values? Um, be very, no, they call it some with the feminine side of things is self-care, self-love. If you don't really think or identify yourself, what's your identity first? You know, how do you identify yourself? And I mean, by identity, I mean, how do you see yourself? Yeah. You see yourself as, an, uh, and then understand your values as a person because currently now, as we know it, kids now are bending over backwards and breaking their value system just to be liked. And they will do things that we've never seen before just to be liked 
and be a part of a community or an organ or or a group. Yeah. And it's pretty frightening what what kids will be doing now. And, yeah, and you know, and if we don't hone down on the values and and ensure that our kids um, love themselves more than anything else before they can love somebody else, and then that's important to me. Yeah. Ensure that they stand on their feet, having very very confidence and good belief systems, and have confidence. Uh, and understanding that you're going to have some roller coaster rides, but they're not too far bounded. They're just yeah. in that realm, isn't it? So yeah. not spiking up and down, but they're staying in, in that little zone. So, yeah. Um, you mentioned that your your charity that you work for with is um, the suicide youth suicide prevention. Yeah. Um, what what else? What other charities and stuff are you working with these days? Well, I own, own, I've still got my own charity and I work with kids with employment pathways and I mentor the kids. So that's okay. part of what I've done and I have been doing for a long time. So I do therapy for kids. Um, I have got a, I'm a, I'm a NLP practitioner um, certified. Um, I have followed a lot of self-development stuff and I really enjoy it. It really, it really does inspire. I really do like this part of, of what I do. Yeah. But I love the employment pathway stuff. So I do the pastoral care component. So I, and that's only a little bit of what I do on that side. I have a wellness program too. So everything revolves around health and wellness because yeah. I really value it because I've lost, you know, through chronic fatigue, I really value my health yeah. immensely. It's probably one of the highest of my hierarchy of values. Yeah. Uh, it sits very high, either one or two. Um, because without your health, you have nothing. You know, that's what I've always said. So that's, that's probably second on my hierarchy of values, yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, what other charities? I know you just uh, recently you did a, was a, was a walk or a run for a charity as well. Oh, that was the, the charity that I work with, I Am Hope. So we, okay, it yep. was called the Dew Drop Hope Challenge, and we did 16 days where we did a triathlon from the top of the North Island, from Tico, right up yep. to the top all the way down to Wellington. So 16 yeah, right. days, uh, starting at about five, ending at about nine, doing some talks twice a day, every day for the 16 days, plus some ridiculous swimming and oceans and biking and running and, and creating awareness around it. But it was awesome. It was fantastic. And we, we really had a great engagement with um, the communities. We raised a lot of money for our charity to sustain our free counselling service. Yeah, so it, it was awesome. It was yeah. so, so well, so well. I, I just, you know, I got to see our country, but I also got to see and understand what people are going through. Um, and it was not great, but yeah. it's the way it is. Yeah, no, that's it. Um, do you still work for, still do some work for Sky Sports? Yeah, I'm doing the game actually on Saturday, the Warriors versus Parramatta. So, oh, yeah. Um, I'm doing that in the studio. I don't do it a lot, but I'm doing one this Saturday. So, yeah, right. Yeah, you still you still enjoy that side of things? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I do like going in there once in a while now. I, I do enjoy it. Skip. It's, it's um, yeah, I do. It's it's not a job. It's something that I just enjoy sometimes. And I and I actually really enjoy doing grassroots footy. Actually, I love yeah. going to the regions and I love doing the uh, local league stuff. It, it, it's um, something I'm really passionate about, but um, when 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 the Warriors are on and the way they've been playing, it's um it's really really cool to be a part of that. Yeah, you know, and, and having Parramatta this weekend, what a game to be uh, to be on actually. So it'll be yeah an important, important game. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially with uh, Gutho, Mitch Moses, and Dylan yeah. Brown out, um, it's a good time to get them. Yeah, it is. And that's that unpredictability right between those two. So they won with, I think, Asi and Matheson uh, at Manly, I think. So they, yeah. they come in with the unpredictability, unsure of what will happen, what sort of chemistry would they make to the side. So there's an unknown there for, for the Warriors, which could be a, a banana skin opportunity yeah. for them. So, And they have did the same with Brock the Brisbane when their players were out and they lost. So... Yeah. They don't want to be going in this game thinking that because they're losing two influential players, that it gives them the right to win. There's no way they're not yeah. they're not taking that stance in this game. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think Parramatta's a bit surprised uh, everyone this year as well. 
They have. Um, it's been awesome you to know, watch. They, they started off very slow and everyone sort of wrote them off. And then that's right. they just creep back up slowly and everyone's like, oh, crap, they're sitting in the top eight now. And Yeah. 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 Um, speaking of the league season, though, who, you know, we're halfway through. Who, who do you think is um, going to take out the, the grand final this year? Who do you, who do you, the two teams that you think are going to probably make the grand final? All right. I don't. I haven't really watched enough of the games to have an educated decision on it, to be honest. I've sort of had pockets of it. Yeah. But I always say that you can never fault what Penrith have done yeah. um, just because of what they've done in the past and, and the, the players they've got, the coaching staff they've got. I can't say that they won't, they won't be up there. Um, yeah. Crikey, it's she's interesting this season though. You know, you got the Roosters hovering at the bottom, and you go, "Wow, should they be there?" Cronulla's starting to pick up. Brisbane have done extremely well. Para is just a force; they potentially can beat anyone on the day. You know, there's there is it's so hard yeah, to pick. Isn't it's, it? exci- it's exciting, and that's yeah. but I, I I couldn't give you another team that that would possibly join them, but. Man, it's like, that's why this this comp's so freaking awesome. Yeah, because it's one of the closely contested years yeah. I've seen in a long yeah. time. Usually, it's one or two teams at the top of the ladder, and everyone else is like daylights behind them. But yeah, that's right. this year, we've got what the top four are nearly equal on points. You know, and it's anyone can beat anyone. I mean, you've seen at the start of the season, Brisbane beat Penrith. Yeah, and then South are beating Brisbane, and you know it's. It's just so up and down. It's it and is. it's so close. It's it's making it. I think this is one of those draw cards for the NRL. It's yeah. been such a closely contested season. Yeah. That everyone's just like, my team can win. My team can win the grand final. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um. But anyway, Richie, thank you so much for joining me. Um. If you are ever in Perth, mate, or ever get a chance to come over here, uh, don't hesitate. Give me a call. Um, and we'll catch up for a beer, or you can, yes. we can meet the Fano. Come over for a, a kai. Yeah. Um, Ready yeah, for I a boil really up. appreciate. You. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> mate. We'll get some boil up going. Oh, exactly. I'm due for um, one now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Richie Barnett, thank you for joining me on NRL Fans WA. I really appreciate you giving me your time. Cheers, brother. No, I appreciate the cordial. No, beautiful. Thank you so much, mate. Cheers, bro. See you, mate. See you, mate.